There's no doubt that the military aggression against Lebanon became inaccessible to the pattern adopted by the Israeli enemy since 1978, which acquired another form of aggression that targeted the supporters of the resistance in the only country that has so far defeated Israel. All plans failed, so Washington decided to suffocate the allies and supporters of the resistance by implementing economic sanctions and by designating Hezbollah an international criminal terrorist organization, all while supporting the largest terrorist entity on the planet, Israel. This new plan required making judicial arguments, assembling files, and falsely linking them together to establish the party's involvement in terrorism and drug crimes on the one hand, and assigning Israel's proxies in the U.S. administration to oversee the implementation of penalties and prosecute people alleged to be affiliated with the party. Their last attempt at sabotaging any entity related to or affiliated with Hezbollah was hacking the party's Al Qard al Hassan financial institution. Qard al Hassan is a 36 years old association that grants small loans with zero interest to help borrowers manage their life hardships, like rebuilding houses, opening small businesses, and covering marriage hardships, regardless of their religious affiliations. Despite the institution's assurance that hackers had no access to any of the internal data or account numbers of depositors, the hackers, till this day, keep posting Excel sheets that anyone can fill or scanned files of depositors' IDs or procuration papers. All the leaked documents were scanned photos obviously taken from a certain folder of the internal administrative communication database between the different departments of each branch and between branches. It was not that of the actual database of the depositor's account details. Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah clarified last week that Al Qard Al Hassan Association gives loans on the basis of mortgaged gold or a mutual guarantor between the borrower and the association, and in no way or form does it fund Hezbollah. Another plan to twist the arm of the resistance falters. Actually, it gave a great marketing push for the association, which saw a considerable turnout of new depositors to open accounts after the speech of Hezbollah Secretary General Sayyid Hassan Nasrullah. Welcome to the Middle East Stream, I'm Marwa Osman. Hezbollah, which has been suffering from four years of Trump's maximum pressure campaign against its resistance forces, is hesitant to show optimism following Joe Biden's presidential election victory. Washington's approach resulted in multiple sanctions on Hezbollah members and companies linked to the political bloc, add to that high probability of hostilities continue to materialize on the border with occupied Palestine, making the chances of a sudden escalation increase steadily. To discuss this issue with us from Beirut is Dr. Mohsen Saleh, political commentator. Thank you very much for being with us, Dr. Saleh. Now, Lebanon's economy is, is highly uh, dollarized, Dr. Saleh, which gives Washington a tremendous leverage to use economic sanctions to deter the Lebanese public from supporting their own resistance back home, the liberation movement in Lebanon. The U.S. has managed to target several political allies of the resistance in Lebanon as well. Now, do you think that they might move forward towards targeting civilians now, or rather just back off after maybe Trump just leaves office? Well, hi, uh, hi to you and to everybody is watching this program. Uh, I guess the United States has used all what it has in order to uh, put down the ambience of Hezbollah, the popularity of Hezbollah. Fortunately, they did not succeed, especially the people, the environment, uh, are embracing this resistance, highly embracing this resistance, and the uh, speeches of uh, Sayyid Nasrallah, last, uh, last one and before the last, show this confidence of the people in the region uh, towards the resistance. So I guess the Americans, whatever they use of their instruments or sanctions, 
the resistance uh, was and still able to overcome all these uh, these silly decisions from the American administration, especially One of the, the major targeted one. associations that were uh, linked to Hezbollah and lately targeted maybe late 2020 uh, was the Qard al-Hassan Association, which is a financial institute that gives out interest-free loans and allows for commission-free deposits. Uh, this association was uh, hacked and I uh, actually spoke with the directors of Qard al-Hassan, uh, who are not doing any uh, media interviews uh, so far um, up until now, but they told me that the hacked server was that which was used for internal administrative communication between the branches and between departments of one branch in particular. So it was not that of the actual database of the depositors' accounts information, rather just Excel sheets that anyone could actually put out there and maybe a couple of scanned files which include maybe IDs and uh, uh, procuration papers. Do you think that this is enough damage to uh, maybe uh, affect the reputation of such an institution and at least maybe shake its uh, uh, reputation in front of the depositors? Well, I, I, uh, I think, I believe the statements was uh, made by Al-Qard al-Hassan uh, manager, managerial committee and uh, that would not influence the clients of Al-Qard al-Hassan and the people, they have a sufficient confidence of this institution. Uh, which uh, helps poor, helps uh, students and uh, doctors and people who want to have uh, a loan in order to buy a car. This is very uh, a small thing, I guess, in terms of, uh, of, of the people, especially in this crisis. You mentioned the economic crisis in Lebanon. However, I would say Al-Qard al-Hassan uh, accelerated its uh, activity the people now, as uh, Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah said, uh, the people would go to Al-Qard al-Hassan and uh, put deposit in in this uh, uh, in this bank, in this bank, their only bank without interest, and they have full confidence with uh, of their money that it's in a safe place. That's why I guess all the uh, these uh, hackers could not influence the uh, the trust or even uh, influence the Al-Qard al-Hassan institution and the programs, the computer programs. Uh, they issued this statement, people were relieved and they are, uh, they are having this uh, good relationship between the clients and the, uh, the managerial community. Mind you, we should also uh, remind the people that it's at times when the people's money are actually locked up in the actual banks in the of banks, Lebanon. Yes, at the same time, it's a secure place for them to invest. But, uh, uh, going back to the sanctions and the pressure against Hezbollah, we had Biden stating that uh, when he takes office in at least like uh, eight or uh, seven or eight days, yeah. he will end Trump's maximum pressure policy against Tehran, hence against all the allies of the resistance in the region. Why is Hezbollah still very hesitant of showing any signs of optimism following Biden's victory? Well, we have been uh, taught, we have been uh, really earned a lot of knowledge about these administrations, whether the Democrats or the uh, Republicans. Uh, if we don't see any uh, advantages from any of them, so we can't talk about good intentions from these uh, presidents. So let's wait and see. Biden uh, and uh, Obama, his president, he was vice president, President of Obama okay. uh, did not show any good intentions towards Iran or towards Lebanon. But I guess the balance of power now in the whole world is changing. Mm -hmm. Probably would the Americans go back to their mind and uh, uh, let the uh, peoples uh, determine their uh, self-identity and self-independent uh, uh, and their autonomy and their slogans and their 
way of life, I guess that's, that needs to be waited until uh, Biden uh, can really be there in the White House. Uh, I, well, we, don't have, we, we don't have, we are not sure. We don't know if he's going to make yeah, it or that's, not that's still. That's yes, true. I absolutely that's, hear that's that. But issue, yeah. one more threat as uh, out there in the face of all Lebanese people is Israel. It keeps threatening a resumption of full-fledged hostilities against the Lebanese resistance, Hezbollah, but mainly against all of Lebanon here. But especially they keep saying that in the near future, in the near future. They keep repeating that uh, word. But I mean, its leaders were obviously disappointed by the loss of Trump in the election. And they basically have lost their main, maybe uh, focal point of normalization in the region in West Asia. Is a full-fledged war against Hezbollah a viable option for Israel at this point in time? Absolutely not. They have tried many times in many wars against Hezbollah and against Lebanon, and they failed in all these wars. So I guess they are trying to maneuver the psychology of people, but the people in the south and in all Lebanon, they uh, challenge these uh, statements from Netanyahu or from some of uh, uh, its soldiers, but I guess uh, the upper hand is for the resistance in this region, especially in the south. Uh, uh, south. And I guess this maneuver would not uh, would not help them. Otherwise, they, w they will be the losers in any uh, coming war. If they, if, if and a big if, mm -hmm. if they try to attack any place in Lebanon, even they, they can't escape even the avenge of Hezbollah from, for uh, one, uh, one mujahid, one uh, fighter, uh, yeah, fighter uh, uh, martyred in, in Syria. How could they dare to do uh, such a war? Mm -hmm. I, I, I really, uh, I really uh, uh, further say that they can't and they would not do that. Well, uh, we have to uh, test maybe and see yeah. whether these mm -hmm. threats are going to yeah. be actually viable or not. I want to thank you That's very true. much, Dr. Mohsen Saleh, political thank commentator, you. for joining us in Beirut to talk about the maximum pressure game that Washington is playing with the axis of resistance and namely Hezbollah in the region. Thank you for being with us. Please stay tuned. Next, we will be talking about the new agreement in the PGCC. Qatar will not halt or make concessions in its relationships with Iran. This is what the Qatari foreign minister declared last week following a solidarity and stability agreement that was signed by Persian Gulf leaders in a landmark summit that took place in the ancient desert city of Al Ula. Saudi Arabia and its allies have restored full relations with Qatar, ending a huge rift that erupted three years ago. New Persian Gulf ties in this following report. The end of the so-called Persian Gulf Rift would constitute a major regional step to adopt a foreign policy that is more attuned to the sensitivities of the other members and thus moderate eventual excesses. This was evident when Qatar declared that it will not alter its relations with Iran last week following a solidarity and stability agreement that was signed by the Persian Gulf leaders in a summit that took place in the ancient desert city of Al Ula. Saudi Arabia and the UAE reconciling with Qatar is a sign that the latter has made few concessions after securing a deal to break the blockade against its borders. Another important development could be vis-a-vis -vis the relations with the Islamic Republic of Iran. Qatar's connections with the Persian power are well known and could be used as a means for an Elbai timid rapprochement in the region of West Asia. Many people have already forgotten that the rift started in 2017 with serious policy differences over how the countries of the Persian Gulf should deal with Iran and treat the Muslim Brotherhood groups contending for influence in the war on Syria. As the rifts begin to heal with this new announcement, the underlying differences have not really been resolved. The parties, at least, have agreed to end the rift's more visible and disruptive effects. 
The ripple effect of the PGCC internal rivalries has been central to the proxy dynamics that have underpinned and shaped the outcomes of political and military developments across the region of West Asia and North Africa since the popular uprisings began in 2011. Despite the purported rapprochement between Persian Gulf parties, it is worth noting that this is seemingly influenced by a desire to preempt pressure from an incoming Biden administration more than a genuine commitment to conflict resolution. As such, the agreement within the PGCC is very unlikely to significantly affect geopolitical dynamics beyond the states involved. Third-party states such as Libya, Tunisia, Sudan, Morocco and Egypt will remain theaters where Persian Gulf players and their allies will continue their proxy interventionism and their scramble to settle geopolitical scores. To discuss this issue with us from London is Sami Hamdi, Editor-in-Chief of the International Interest. Thank you for being with us, Sami, to discuss this new agreement between the Persian Gulf states, uh, between Saudi Arabia, the Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and also Egypt is there. They cited uh, Doha's ties to Iran and Turkey as core reasons for their extraordinary uh, decision back in 2017 to cut diplomatic and transport links to uh, Qatar. Yet today, after the new side agreement between Qatar and Saudi Arabia, the former still insists that it will not change its relationship with Iran. So what was the point of the uh, severance to begin with? I think it's important to remember or to highlight that the blockade had nothing to do with Qatar's relations with Iran or any of the 13 conditions that were imposed, except when it comes to Al Jazeera's coverage. The blockade was imposed primarily because Saudi Arabia, UAE, Egypt and Bahrain uh, were essentially uh, very worried and very concerned by Qatar's ongoing support for movements uh, uh, that uh, uh, lean more towards uh, the popular desire, whether that's in Tunisia, whether that's in Libya. By that, I don't necessarily mean that Qatar supported democracy or democratic trends, but that Qatar supported a movement that threatened the regimes uh, of Saudi Arabia, of UAE, of Egypt and Bahrain. And I think the Iran point was more to try to get the US on board, to get Trump on board, as opposed to anything seriously regarding Qatar and Iran's uh, relationship. Well, that's really interesting, Sami, because it's being propagated on most Western mainstream media that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, the kingdom's actual day-to-day -day ruler, wanted to resolve the rift to gain credibility with the upcoming uh, Biden administration in the US. What is Mohammed bin Salman afraid of here? So, I mean, Biden becomes president and he is still at role with Qatar. What would happen then? Who cares? I think the Democrats uh, have always uh, been averse to Mohammed bin Salman following the murder of Khashoggi. They've been averse to Saudi Arabia's role in the war in Yemen and the humanitarian crisis and the inability of the Saudis to bring about a resolution either by peace or either by military solution in Yemen. The U.S. is not really interested in peace. It's always interested in who the winner is. But given there is no winner and given that there is a humanitarian crisis, uh, there is a fear that the Democrats will implement retrospective punitive measures on Mohammed bin Salman. Mm -hmm. Mohammed bin Salman believes that Al Jazeera and Qatar's uh, extensive media outlets in English and in Arabic have played a key role in fueling uh, anti-Bin Salman sentiment in Washington. Their lobbying networks, very influential, have influenced attitudes in Washington towards Mohammed bin Salman. That's bin Salman's perspective, by the way, mm -hmm. not necessarily mine, which is that bin Salman's actions naturally bring I about... I wanted to say that, that because antagonism. basically but there are war bin crimes Salman's in Yemen. So a deal from the Qataris that the media outlets will be quiet, that they will mm -hmm. give him some peace. And this is about shelving contentious issues, including Yemen, where we saw the formation of a government and a willingness to now negotiate with the Houthis, mm -hmm. including uh, this idea that bin Salman now is trying to shelve any contentious issue that might draw antagonism from Biden. And this is why it's important to note, if Trump had won, it's very unlikely we would have seen any reconciliation exactly. at all. Exactly. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, uh, also, we have uh, uh, many analysts, especially uh, regional ones, saying that the OE in particular had been reluctant with regard to uh, the rapprochement that happened with Qatar, uh, partly because of Abu Dhabi's concerns about Qatar's growing relationship with Turkey as the power struggle between the two states intensified last year, specifically in Libya, for example. But what changed UAE's mind? I mean, could there be any benefit for them out of this reconciliation right now? The UAE's uh, power in the region is underpinned by its alliance with Egypt and Saudi Arabia and taking advantage of their weaknesses. 
And that is what has made the UAE into a regional power. It's an alliance of fear between UAE and Saudi Arabia, not an alliance of common aims uh, or ambitions. And you, the UAE is seething with anger that bin Salman acted unilaterally and dragged uh, UAE into a reconciliation that it did not want, it did not seek. You will remember that Yusuf al utaiba the ambassador, the UAE ambassador to Washington, said in, in the middle of November that reconciliation was not on anybody's priority list. There was a sort of defiance coming out of the UAE. Abdul Khalik Abdullah on Twitter, a prominent UAE commentator, said there will be no reconciliation without the UAE's consent, drawing mm -hmm. the ire of Saudi Saudis who said, who are you to talk about Saudi Arabia like this? We are the big brother in the region. Mm -hmm. I think the UAE did not want it because it believes it doesn't need this reconciliation. The UAE believes that its normalization of ties with Israel uh, it puts it in good stead with an incoming Biden administration. It's been developing its ties with Iran over the past two years, so it's ready for these negotiations that are expected between Biden and Iran. And it believes that bin Salman, uh, his fears are exaggerated over a Biden administration and that together they are able to resist any antagonism from Biden. And this is why we see that even statements coming out uh, from UAE and from Egypt, which suggest more confusion uh, than acceptance of, of this reconciliation. And also Qatari insistence that this was more a reconciliation between a bilateral reconciliation between Saudi and Qatar as opposed to with the wider uh, countries. I want to thank you very, very much, Sami, and I will have you back again so we can talk about this. Thank you for your time. Now, please stay tuned next week. We will talk more about this on the Mideast stream.